Here's a story about hair loss cause and effect that I'm sharing so that you never make the same mistake. In 2015, my sister's friend, he took a startup job in San Francisco. The hours were long, the stress was insane, and his pay was mostly in equity, not cash. A few months later, he wore all of that stress all over his face. We're talking huge eye bags, constantly getting colds. He gained a ton of weight. He was sleeping something like five hours a night, and his hair also started to shed like crazy. Fast forward three years later, the company succeeded. He made a ton of money, like retirement level money. My sister met up with him for coffee and she hadn't seen him in years. In that time, he lost a ton of hair. He pointed to his head and said, this is what stress will do to you. He's not wrong. Studies show that stress can cause hair loss and that long working hours are linked to higher prescription rates for drugs like finasteride. In fact, Three studies on identical twins all show that genetically identical twins can bald at different rates, with the twin that has more divorces and more work-related stress tending to bald faster. But now, my sister's friend, he wasn't working. He wasn't stressed. So he decided to refocus on his health and also his hair. So what does a 20-something with near unlimited funds do? Well, he moves to Bali, takes up surfing, tosses the processed foods, he gets a personal trainer, he starts exercising like crazy, he cuts out the drinking, he basically becomes a living, breathing embodiment of the Andrew Huberman podcast. And yet two years later, he's down 50 pounds, he's got a six pack, his eye bags are gone, he's sleeping nine hours a night, he's got flawless skin, exceptional lab work, even for functional medicine ranges. He's genuinely never felt happier, but his hair looks exactly the same. He still is mostly bald, and in that typical horseshoe pattern that we see in men with androgenic alopecia, or pattern hair loss. So why is that? Why is it that stress contributed to this man's health and hair problems, but the elimination of that stress only improved his health, not his hair? In reality, my sister's friend made a very common treatment mistake conflating hair loss cause and effect. In short, he presumed that the thing contributing to his hair fall was the only thing he needed to target to reverse his hair fall. It sounds logical, but not in the world of hair loss where the equations that explain outcomes like this are actually multivariate. In this video, we'll reveal what this person did wrong and how you can always avoid this mistake. We'll also reveal a framework that you can apply to make sense of your entire history with hair loss. When it first started, periods of acceleration, potential periods of deceleration or pause, all the way up to where you are today. So you can stop guessing why am I losing hair? Is it genes? Is it stress? Is it gut dysbiosis, a mold toxicity? And you can start to get clarity. You can start building a more robust, more targeted treatment protocol, and you can start unlocking another level of hair regrowth. That's all coming up. Here's a framework to explain most, but not all, cases of hair loss for people who are watching this video. It involves a key interaction point that you need to understand between two kinds of hair loss. And once you understand this, you'll see exactly what our Bali Living tech mogul did wrong. And if you're losing hair, you'll now have a frame of reference to clarify your contributing factors versus root causes so you can form better treatment plans. Let's set the scene with how a healthy scalp is supposed to operate and what goes wrong when we start losing hair. In a healthy scalp, our hairs are constantly going through cycles of growing, resting, shedding, and repeating over and over and over. Most hairs grow for about two to seven years, at which point they stop growing, the hair sheds out, the follicle degenerates, a new follicle regenerates to take the old one's place, and then that cycle repeats. At any given time, it's normal for about 10 to 15% of our hairs to be in that shedding stage of our hair cycle. And this is why we can shed up to 150 plus hairs per day, even without a hair loss problem. Those hairs, they are always getting replaced. And this hair cycle that repeats and repeats it's governed partly by our genetics, along with hormones and proteins that are influenced by our external environment. So how can our hair cycle go awry? It's simple. The hormones and proteins that govern our hair cycle process, they get disrupted. And this disruption ends up causing excessive amounts of hair to shed out, 
or it causes longer windows of time for when those hairs shed and then new hairs come in to take their place. When this disruption occurs, it's called telogen effluvium, and it can be caused by one of thousands of possibilities. On the acute side, You've got singular stressors, singular events. So think rapid weight loss, traumatic surgery, bereavement, severe illness. On the more chronic side of shedding, you have regularly present stressors. So vitamin D deficiencies that persist, iron imbalances that persist, heavy metal toxicities with consistent exposure, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, gut dysbiosis, the colonization of pathogenic microorganisms in the scalp and many, many, many others. Any of these triggers can disrupt those proteins and hormones that govern that hair cycle, which then trigger excessive hair shedding. And when that percent of shedding hair moves beyond that 10 to 15% threshold, we now technically have telogen effluvium. It tends to present diffusely across our entire scalps, and its severity often depends on A, how many triggers you have present, and B, what the magnitude of those triggers are. So on the minor side, you can have slight increases to hair shedding from something as innocuous as hair cycle seasonality. And this occurs in nearly everyone in the Northern Hemisphere in July and August. This is where shifts in our circadian rhythm and our exposure to sunlight, they trigger minor bouts of hair shedding, and they're typically so small that they're visually undetectable. Less a few more hairs that you might see on your pillowcase in those later summer months. But on the major side of things, you can see significant increases to hair shedding with maybe a severe vitamin D deficiency or significant hypothyroidism, or even a collection of minor nutrient imbalances that individually don't amount to a problem, but collectively cause enough dysregulation to trigger that disruption of our hair cycle and thereby a lot of shedding. Again, there's a big gradient here. And while a minor stress-inducing event at work, it's probably not going to evoke a hair shedding event, persistent psychological stress at work probably can, especially when that stress starts to interfere with other aspects of your life. So we're talking your sleep, your insulin sensitivity, your weight control, your eating habits, maybe your nutrient repletion because of your food choices and any other symptoms that have overlap in the regulation of hormones and proteins governing that hair cycle process. And this brings us back to that case study at the beginning of this video. Based on what I described, that person almost certainly has hair loss from telogen effluvium. And he's not just showing it with diffuse thinning. He's also wearing those symptoms on his face and on his body. I mean, he's not healthy. And yet that can't be the whole story of his hair loss case because with nearly all scenarios of telogen effluvium, when somebody is able to identify and then resolve their triggers, they also tend to resolve 100% of their hair loss. So say for a period of time, your life completely falls apart. Your boss is constantly chewing you out. You stop going outside and you basically live in the office. You get a severe vitamin D deficiency. You start eating processed foods. You gain a ton of weight. You end up under eating protein and you go through this massive telogen effluvium shed. Then if you're able to identify and then unwind those problems, so changing jobs, getting a new boss, improving your vitamin D, eating a nutrient replete diet, maybe de-stressing more on the weekends, spending time with friends, then in about three to six months time, your disrupted hair cycles should start to normalize. And then a few months after that, they should start producing viable hairs. And then in one to two years time, it's supposed to look as though you've never had a hair loss problem in the first place. And this is because telogen effluvium by itself is actually a temporary form of hair loss. So as long as you identify and fix its root causes, you can 100% reverse the problem. But this is only true if telogen effluvium is your only kind of hair loss. And for our case study at the beginning of this video, we're going to find out that that isn't the case. And this brings us to our second common hair loss disorder, androgenic alopecia. We'll explain what it is, how it progresses, what its causes are, and how androgenic alopecia can actually interact with telogen effluvium with one feeding into the other. 
So androgenic alopecia is so common, you can't walk down a city block without spotting somebody with this hair loss disorder. It's chronic and progressive, meaning that without treatment, it tends to worsen over time. In men, it often starts as temple recession or a bald spot, which over a number of years tends to progress to a slick bald scalp. In women, it can start as diffuse thinning, which then worsens over time. It's caused by genetics and a hormone called dihydrotestosterone. And there are also other factors involved. For more information on this, check out our video on what causes hair loss, the debates. And like telogen effluvium, androgenic alopecia also involves excessive hair shedding, albeit with one big distinction here. In androgenic alopecia, hair shedding resolves into hair follicle miniaturization. Here's what I mean. In this kind of hair loss disorder, when an affected hair sheds out, it doesn't grow back the same size. Instead, when that new hair follicle is regenerating, hormones and proteins inside of the scalp, they damage the base of that hair follicle while it's trying to form. This damage then forms a smaller hair follicle, which produces a smaller hair strand. And then when that hair grows and eventually sheds out, and then that follicle degenerates, that process repeats and repeats and repeats. And eventually the affected hairs look so thin and wispy that you can barely see them at all. And you end up with more or less a scalp that looks like this. This progressive thinning is a process called hair follicle miniaturization. It's also a defining characteristic of androgenic alopecia. Dermatologists and doctors will use it as a criteria to help make a differential diagnosis between shedding from telogen effluvium or shedding from early stage androgenic alopecia. For more information on that, check out our video on diagnosing hair loss disorders. Also check out the interactive guide that we released for free attached to that video on hair loss types so that you can get a look at how each hair loss disorder progresses for men and women at both a morphological and histological level. But the big thing to know really is that the causes of androgenic alopecia here, they're different from the causes of telogen effluvium. That means the treatments are going to be different as well. Successful treatments for androgenic alopecia, they target hormones like DHT and those other factors mentioned in the what causes hair loss video. Successful treatments for telogen effluvium, first identify the individual causes in yourself and then address those at an individual level. So with that, let's recap everything we just covered. Two common types of hair loss are telogen effluvium and androgenic alopecia. Telogen effluvium is temporary. Androgenic alopecia is chronic and progressive, at least without treatment. Both hair loss types involve hair shedding. Intelligent effluvium, hairs that shed will grow back the same size, provided the triggers are resolved. In androgenic alopecia, hairs that shed will grow back progressively miniaturized, provided the hair loss disorder remains untreated. Now that we've reviewed that, you, you probably have already put together exactly what happened to my sister's friend. So let's revisit the story with this new framework in mind. My sister's friend probably had the hormonal and genetic profile to develop androgenic alopecia. I mean, after all, his hair loss progressed in a horseshoe pattern that's very typical of men with androgenic alopecia. Yes, he had a really high stress job and that stress probably contributed to several bouts of telogen effluvium which then accelerated his rate of hair shedding. That stress probably caused temporary hair loss, but it also sped up the progression of his androgenic alopecia. I mean, after all, that miniaturization process, it depends on hair shedding. Higher stress, higher rates of hair shedding, more opportunities for hair follicle miniaturization, and a faster advancement of androgenic alopecia. So my sister's friend, really experienced an acceleration of androgenic alopecia due to chronic stress from his working environment. This is known as telogen effluvium unmasking androgenic alopecia, and it is very well documented in the clinical literature. So yes, resolving stress probably helped this man normalize aspects of his hair cycling and maybe regrow a little bit of hair. But because stress reduction did nothing to address the other half of his hair loss equation, that androgenic alopecia component, the hair shedding continued to resolve in progressive miniaturization, which then left him with better health outcomes from his interventions, the diet, the lifestyle stuff. But it didn't leave him with better hair. 
Reducing stress didn't regrow his hair because his stress was simply feeding into a progressive hair loss disorder with different root causes requiring different root treatments, treatments that he was not pursuing. And that's the problem. This framework, it doesn't just apply to stress-induced hair loss feeding into androgenic alopecia. It really applies to any cause of telogen effluvium feeding into androgenic alopecia. Iron deficiencies, low vitamin D, hypothyroidism, rapid weight loss, microorganism overgrowths, heavy metal toxicity, seasonal hair shedding, medication usage. There are so many cases. For more, check out our video on telogen effluvium. We dive into a bunch of them. And my hope with this video is that you can reflect on this person's story and your individual hair loss situation and maybe start using this framework to start making sense of times where you felt like your hair loss potentially accelerated. Was it in the summer? Was it shortly after periods of stress? Did your hair loss accelerate or accompany periods of poorer health for you? Because if any of that's true, you might've had minor bouts of telogen effluvium that could have been further unmasking underlying genetic androgenic alopecia. And if you don't know how to unpack those causes and interaction points properly, you might inadvertently conflate that reducing your stress or resolving that vitamin D deficiency will also resolve your hair loss from androgenic alopecia. But in reality, that's just half the equation. So for those watching this video, if you are serious about fighting hair loss, consider finding a doctor or a dermatologist who specializes in hair loss disorders to help you do a full health scalp and hair evaluation. You really need to clearly identify your hair loss causes, your hair loss diagnoses. You need to build an action plan to tackle each component, not just part of them. And for people who are actually looking for this level of personal support from me or my team, we do this exercise for everybody inside of our membership community. Not only have we built interactive guides and tools that help you identify your hair loss and all of its potential triggers, we also will personally find you a dermatologist located in your nearest major city and not from a private clinic where they're always just trying to sell you into PRP or hair transplants. We actually focus on university or teaching hospital attached dermatologists who are professors of dermatology and who have recent publications in the hair loss disorders in which we suspect you might have. So you're not gonna be wasting time or money going to somebody who's just gonna to try to upsell you into exosomes or PRP plus A cell. And we'll even give you a video along with a PDF that you can print out to bring to your dermatologist that virtually guarantees that based on the questions you're going to ask them, they're going to look at your scalp with a micro zoom device and give you an accurate and thorough assessment. So if you're interested in this level of personal support, you can absolutely access that from me and my team in the membership program, which I will link below. Otherwise, if you just want the directional insights into your hair loss and you're fine finding your own dermatologists and doctors, check out our video on hair loss causes, check out our video on hair loss types, check out the interactive guides attached to those and get on a more robust treatment protocol. We wish you the best of success in all aspects of health and hair and we will see you in the next video.